Several months ago, our senior pastor, John Witten, came to me with this idea and this website called the Caring Well Challenge. The Caring Well ministry team at Pioneer Drive is a part of a broader effort put together by the Southern Baptist Convention in an effort to um, help survivors of abuse, um, both within and outside of the church. Uh, we've assembled a team of 15 different uh, individuals with varying uh, experience in their career field, some with their own survivor stories themselves. And so I'm looking forward to this year, even though it's a tough subject, even though it's a challenging um, issue that our entire world faces um, at this point in time, uh, we're looking ahead uh, with hope that we can um, contribute to uh, the health and the healing of our community in the area of sexual abuse. Here's a brief introduction to the members of our Caring Well team. Hi, I'm Elaine Summers, and this Caring Well Challenge is extremely important to me because I am a survivor of a very traumatic childhood, and I have learned how to survive and go beyond surviving to thriving again. And I believe that part of the call of the church is to walk alongside those people and to help those people who have trauma events happen to them and know that the church is going to love on them and to show them God's love. Hi, I'm Connie Davis. I've been a member here at Pioneer Drive for about 13 years. Um, I've spent almost 30 years of my life working with abuse and neglect children who have been victims. Um, I work for Child Protective Services and um, I'm part of this group. I am so proud that Pioneer Drive is going to be doing this. I'm so glad that they are stepping out into the community and they're saying publicly that, you know, we want to help people who have been victims of abuse and neglect. It is my hope that the members here will see God's presence in what we say and what we do and understand that there are genuine hurting people in our community of faith and that we really want to reach out and help them. I'm Josh Letty. I'm a physical therapist at Hendrick Medical Center North. I've been a church member roughly 10 years, almost 11. Um, had the opportunity, if you will, to join the Carewell team. Nathan invited me because of both personal and professional experiences. Looking forward to the opportunity to put a face to a name, to be somebody in the congregation if somebody needs questions, needs to reach out, needs somebody to talk to. My name is Sierra Greenwood and I wanted to be a part of the Caring Well team because I wanted to bring to light things that are happening around us. Um, I wanted people to feel like they have somewhere to turn to and to talk to about some hard situations or some uh, uncomfortable things. I wanted us to be able to, as a church, say we hear you and we're with you on that. My name is Gayla De La Vega, and I am uh, participating in the Caring Well Initiative. Um, Nathan first emailed several months ago uh, when it was just a thought, and it piqued my interest because I do feel like um, we need to bring awareness to the things that um, can be happening and that are happening in our churches. Hi, my name is Stella Archuleta. I have worked with a preschool Sunday school girls in action and I'm a mom I am thankful to be able to be part of the caring well team I do think it's important that we are trained to recognize abuse that we are to protect and help um, uh, victims uh, children teens adults in our church and in our community I think we've used Jesus as an example of the Good Shepherd, and that is what we need to do too. We need to protect, guide, and defend these victims. Well, I'm Adam Beesman, um, and I'm a part of the Caring Well team here um, at our church. And I'm a physician, and I practice medicine in the area of psychiatry. Um, and so I think the you know Caring Well team is very much um, you know kind of in my wheelhouse of um, expertise and sexual assault and sexual sexual abuse has been something that has you know kind of long been um, ignored and not well addressed um, and not just in the the church but um, in the world in general um, and it is very much an, an epidemic um, and it's something that you know we need to address um, specifically in the church I think it's really important um, that we have um, the you know, kind of safe place to be able to, to talk about that 
Um, and it's been a hard thing to talk about because it's uncomfortable. Um, and so I think in general it's been ignored because it's uncomfortable and it's just easier to ignore it than deal with it. Um, and that, that's something that's, that's not okay. Um, and so I, I feel like this Caring Well team can help um, prepare um, the church and prepare the, the staff within the church to be able to create that safe place um, where people can come and, and find help and find comfort and find safety um, after experiencing you know, any type of abuse. My name is uh, Paul Naredo. I'm a member of the Caring Well team. I just want to say that this is a, an underlooked and truly painful part of church that we don't want to talk about, but we have to peel back that, that wound so that we can get some healing and get the antiseptic of, of sunshine on it. We don't want to, to repeat the mistakes of our past and we want people to understand that it's, it's okay to come and to receive help. My name is Emily Beesman. I'm part of the Caring Well team because I have lots of experience working in child welfare and as a mental health therapist for kiddos that were in foster care and extreme like abuse and neglect situations. So I'm hoping that my experience can help somebody else. I'm Taylor Anderson. Um, I've been a pediatric nurse in the Abilene area for eight years now. Um, and that is a lot of the reason that the Caring Well ministry is important to me. Um, I think it's very important to be the voice for the voiceless um, and to help people um, have an avenue to feel safe to open up about um, you know abuse that they've been through and so um, that's you know a big part of why I think this is important um, and I think our church can really grow um, together in learning how to navigate this and support um, church members and children um, in our church through the experiences they've been through. I'm Sonia Besson and I'm excited to be a part of this ministry team and this great church that really does care well for the church body. I feel like our community, our city, our state and our nation right now are in a crisis regarding abuse and it's the local church's job to address this and to keep our youth and our children safe that are in our care. It's also our job to minister to, to support survivors of abuse, and to extend the healing hand of Jesus to people that have been through these traumatic situations. I'm Crystal Sutton, the wife of Jim, the mother and mother-in-law of Jason, Emma, and the grandmother to sweet seven-month-old Maggie. I am also a survivor and, yes, an overcomer through years of counseling and therapy of early childhood sexual abuse and assault by an extended family member. Being on the Caring Well team is the fulfillment of Genesis 50-20 in my life, where Joseph tells his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God, God has turned it to something good. Our God is faithful, praise his holy name. We want to do all we can for our church to become safe for survivors. 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 And safe from abuse. 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 What good is a shepherd without a face? On September 15th, 1963, almost 58 years to the day, in Birmingham, Alabama, four members of the Ku Klux Klan placed 19 sticks of dynamite beneath the east side steps of 16th Street Baptist Church. The explosion was devastating. As many as 22 adults were seriously injured and four innocent little girls were murdered. The church building itself sustained uh, damage, significant damage. The steps were destroyed. Brick and stone and wood lay in rubble, and the beautiful stained glass windows were shattered, except for one. The stained glass portrait that portrayed Jesus as the good shepherd still remained intact, 
though with one missing component. The face of Jesus had been lost in the tragedy. In the midst of pain and violence and trauma, many have asked, where's Jesus? Turn with me, if you will, to the Gospel of John, chapter 10. Today is our Caring Well Sunday, and we want to thank Russell Moore and Grant Gaines as uh, we've been inspired by their sermons and their insight on this same issue as we were preparing for this week. And as we consider how to love victims of sexual abuse well and the vitality of being a church of safety and transparency that reflects the heart of the Good Shepherd, we turn to Jesus' words in John Chapter 10, verse 1. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes to only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock. And scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. In the New Testament, Jesus' church is called a flock. We are the sheep of God's pasture. We have a good shepherd. Jesus has some very challenging words for us this morning. For among God's flock, there exists more than sheep and their shepherd. In Jesus' own words, there are robbers and there are thieves and there are wolves and there are hired hands. In the church, we must grapple with the reality that we have children and vulnerable people in large numbers who have been going through the ongoing horrors of sexual abuse. Today, as we enter into this difficult and sensitive topic, our prayer is that those who have been abused would know that you are seen, you are heard, and you're taken seriously. Jesus is with you. Your pastors are with you, and we're committed to being a church that stands with you. Part of addressing this issue requires us this morning to address common misconceptions and false assumptions that are often made about it. So two common false assumptions made. Number one, sexual abuse is rare. It's not rare. It's common. It's far more common than any of us would care to imagine. This evil has been uncovered in every single sector of society, Hollywood, Washington, Boy Scouts, major media sector, and yes, churches. In 2019, a Houston Chronicle report uncovered over 700 credible reports of sexual abuse allegations in the last 15 years in the Southern Baptist Convention alone. Some victims were as young as three years old. And these are just the cases where people are willing to speak up. Can you imagine how many more there are where victims are too afraid or too ashamed to say anything? 
So they bury it. They hide it away. They, they keep it to themselves. This is happening in churches. There should be no safer place for children in all the world than their church. But it has not been this way. The truth is that robbers and thieves and wolves have found their way in. They've had success at hiding who they are. And they've traumatized children. We make an assumption that this is rare. In fact, it's not rare at all. And I realize that this is uncomfortable. And to some extent, I want it that way. The uncomfortable reality is that the problem doesn't just exist over there. It exists right here. God convict us when we're tempted to speak of the problem as if it's out there. We say, you know, the, these things happen uh, in churches, but they happen in the Catholic church. They don't happen in the Protestant church. Or maybe we say, well, well maybe they happen in some Protestant evangelical churches, but, but not in my church, not in my congregation, not, not in my family. We know each other. We, we trust each other. Those things are terrible. And, and yeah, they happen over there. They happen in that denomination or in that organization, but not here. The truth is that it has happened all throughout our denomination, the Southern Baptist Convention. And we've all seen the news the last five years. It's happened right here at Pioneer Drive Baptist Church. We cannot say it's somebody else's problem. It's our problem. As members of this ever-expanding family, it's my problem. And it's your problem. And it's our responsibility in what we're doing today, standing up, acknowledging it, repenting of it, lamenting over it, and saying, as a family, never again. The second common assumption we make is that victims are given due justice. This is also false. We think because we hear about it today or, or because the media is talking about it more these days that, that people are treated fairly when in fact there are many instances remaining of cries going unheard, of reports being dismissed. One of the major reasons that we have awful things happen and they continue to happen and they continue to go unaddressed is because we often think that we have a sense of our own invulnerability. We think of these things as being problems out there but not in here, we forget. The fact that there are thieves and robbers and wolves, even in our own midst. And this is the thing about thieves and robbers and wolves. They use the people of God as a cover. They put on the clothes, the outer appearance of a sheep. They use polished theological language and, and singing abilities and, and teaching abilities and powerful testimonies and passionate prayers and knowledge of scripture and generosity with finances and generosity with time. And they can put on all the regalia and all the characteristics of the people of God, but the intent of their hearts is evil. Nothing, nothing is more satanic than using the disguise of a Jesus follower to prey on vulnerable people. To steal joy and kill innocence and destroy people's lives right in the very place that they're supposed to be receiving life? So keeping this conversation in the light of, of uh, John chapter 10, I also want to give you a couple of examples from the rest of the Bible of instances of sexual abuse. What does the Bible say about sexual abuse? First, in a day and age where it was even more common or at least more accepted than it is today, the Mosaic law forbid it. From Deuteronomy chapter 22. But if out in the country a man happens to meet a young woman pledged to be married and rapes her, only the man who has done this shall die. Do nothing to the woman. She has committed no sin deserving death. This case is like that of someone who attacks and murders a neighbor. So we have an instance of rape. This is a heinous sin in the Old Testament, deserving of death. The man who did it, the law says, should die. 
The victim is not blamed or shamed. Notice that there are no caveats for clothing choices. There are no caveats for the time of day or the location where the crime took place. There is not any stipulation or excuse that would soften the offense or shift even an ounce of blame to the victim. The blame is on the abuser and the abuser alone. And here's probably the most well-known instance of sexual abuse in the whole Bible. Second Samuel chapter 11. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. When we typically think of this story, we put it in terms of adultery. Some even think, well, Bathsheba, you know, she was asking for it. She was bathing on the roof. This is where historical context helps us out. Everyone bathed on their roofs. That's where you went to bathe. And in a culture like that, when the king demanded to see a person when he used his influence and his position and his power to coerce a married woman into his bed, that's abuse. It's abuse of power and it's sexual abuse. We see over and over again throughout scripture where sexual abuse is condemned. And if you're sitting there thinking, you know, I've never abused anyone in that way and I would never do that. So what does any of this have to do with me? A careful reading of scripture would teach us that it is incumbent on all of us to seek justice for the oppressed, to fight for the poor, to care for the weak and the orphans, to help fight against the evils of our societies and our communities and our world to protect the vulnerable. Biblical justice precludes turning a blind eye to those that have been abused. Ezekiel 34, four says, you have not strengthened those that were weak, healed those that were sick, bandaged those that were injured. You have not brought back those that strayed away or looked for those that were lost. You have ruled them harshly and violently. Biblical justice precludes ignoring those who have been abused. It precludes failing to seek justice for the perpetrator and healing for the victim. In the John chapter 10 passage, Jesus speaks of hired hands. He says, when the hired hand sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. The hired hand knows something is going down in the pen. They know that the sheep are in danger, but they just flat out don't care. Hired hands are concerned with their own safety, with their own paycheck, with their own reputation, their own position. They care about themselves and they run when they see danger. Now, the natural instinct, of course, is self-preservation. And it's happened that when there have been instances of abuse in the church, some people have tried to cover it up. They've tried to hide it away. They've tried to make excuses. They've spoken of protecting the church as an entity from exposure or of protecting the faith from a scandal or of protecting Christ from a blemish. Let's just handle it internally. We don't, we don't know the details. It's just hearsay. We can't go around making accusations. You know, so-and-so has served here for 20 years. We, 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 we don't need to involve outside authorities. Notice that all these phrases have one common goal, to keep the abuse under wraps. In the midst of a scandal, hired hands will say things that sound like they're trying to protect the church or to protect God, but the truth is that they're trying to protect themselves. It's not that they want to enable abuse. It's just that they don't want to deal with the consequences of a public scandal happening in their town or in their church or under their watch. New Testament scholar D.A. Carson says thieves and robbers are obviously wicked. The hired hand is not wicked, simply more committed to his own well-being than to the well-being of the sheep. When care for the flock is neither too arduous or too dangerous, he's willing to work and receive his pay. But when he sees the wolf coming, 
when there's danger to his own skin, he retires forthwith and abandons the sheep. The hired hand will abandon the abused by trying to minimize the damage to the church, to Christianity, to the name of Jesus, really to themselves. What they don't see is that they are worsening the damage done to the victim. Listen to me, I can't say it any plainer than this. Jesus does not need your protection. Jesus's church does not need your protection. It's the abused and the vulnerable and the oppressed that need protection. And the one who covers up sin, the one who downplays abuse, who turns a blind eye to oppression is not working with Jesus. They're fighting him. It's the hired hand that downplays and dismisses and covers up and makes excuses. But the good shepherd loves his sheep and he would sooner lay down his life. He did lay down his life. Then abandon them in their time of need. Jesus doesn't work to hide sin in his church. Jesus never authorizes the church to protect his reputation when there is abuse. Jesus does the opposite. He turns on the light so that the work of the evil one can be exposed. This is the way of the good shepherd. So the question is put to us this morning. How will we respond at Pioneer Drive as a church? How will we respond to these things? Every 98 seconds, an American is assaulted. One out of three women and one out of four men have experienced sexual abuse at some point in their lives. By the age of 18, one in four women and one in six males have experienced sexual abuse. Some of those people are in this room right now. To those who have been abused... I want you to hear me clearly this morning. My heart breaks. This wasn't your fault. It was the fault of your abuser. Jesus loves you. Your pastors love you. We want to walk alongside you. If you've been too ashamed or too afraid to speak up, please know that this morning that we are committed to safety. We're committed to transparency. We're committed to justice. We're committed to accountability. We're committed to you. The truth is that this is not just a problem out there. It's a problem in here. And that's why we're announcing this morning the formation of a new team at Pioneer Drive, the Caring Well Team. The Caring Well Team exists to serve two purposes. First, they exist to look at policies and training procedures in place and ensure that we keep our flock safe from abuse. Second, they exist to listen to the Spirit as we work to be a place of safety where survivors can be heard, taken seriously, and ultimately experience the healing of Jesus. I want you to be aware today of some of the things we already have in place in the interest of safety and protection. We work with a group called Ministry Safe. We've adopted their recommendations for policies that work to protect our children. These policies require that a background check be done on all staff and all volunteers who work with children. That's not enough. That's not nearly enough. We personally interview every volunteer and staff member at Pioneer Drive. All volunteers that work with children are required to interview with our staff. Additionally, all these volunteers and all staff have to go through a one-hour sexual abuse training through Ministry Safe and have their references checked. Furthermore, all of our staff have undergone continuing education training in the area of watching for grooming behaviors. Grooming behaviors are behaviors that a predator might use to build trust with the gatekeepers, with the parents or, or the staff or the volunteers to gain access to children. Another essential part of that policy is that our staff must report allegations of sexual abuse. It will not be handled internally. Mandatory reporting is the law. And criminal allegations are going to be handled by the appropriate governing authorities. We want to be clear that sometimes the response to these things of 
religious people is to try and hyper-spiritualize the problem. It's just a spiritual issue. We can handle it internally. Sometimes victims are discouraged from coming forward. Sometimes they try to keep them silent. They tell them things like, think about what will happen to that person or, or think about what will happen to these people or think about what will happen to your church or to your own family. This is a manipulation. The truth is that God has created government authority and ordained governing authorities to deal with matters such as this. In Romans chapter 13, we read where Paul speaks about God establishing all government authority. And and Paul calls governing authorities God's servants to bring punishment to the wrongdoer. We can provide counseling for the victim, but that's not enough. Justice is necessary for a proper resolution. Yes, we can counsel the abuser. Yes, we can forgive. Yes, there can be forgiveness for an abuser. But that doesn't mean that they don't face justice. It doesn't mean that they ever get access to children or to adults that they may be tempted to harm again. We want you to know this morning that we're committed to these things. That's why we've created the Caring Well team. It's why we're a staff who sees and who cares and who's dedicated to handling these things the right way. Our Caring Well team and our ministry staff is going to ensure that we are at the top of the class, so to speak, when it comes to working to prevent sexual abuse and to care for those that have been abused in our midst. If you have been abused, please hear us clearly this morning. Jesus cares for you. He hears your cries. He knows what the robbers and the thieves and the wolves have done to you. At Pioneer Drive, we care for you. We want to listen to you. We want to walk alongside you. We want to help bring resolution and healing in your life. Today, if you need to talk to someone, we have a place for you where we have trained people available to help you. After the service, you can go right out here to our gathering office suite. Someone will meet you um, that's been professionally trained to counsel people who have been through that particular trauma. You can email caringwell at pioneerdrive.org. Someone will reach out to you. You can visit with one of our pastors and we would love to help you find professional counseling options, which we can make available for you. You may grapple against the voice of those who have tried to shame you, to harm you, to silence you, We want to invite you this morning into vulnerability, into safety. We want to talk to you. Don't think for one minute that we'll start to look at you as broken or or that you can't serve anymore. You know, oftentimes it's those who have lived through the horror of sexual abuse. They're the very ones that God calls and equips to lead in ministering to those who have had that vulnerability exploited. The church is meant to be a place that comes together and bears one another's burdens so that we're able to hear from one another the words that we first hear from Jesus. He loves us. He doesn't shame us or blame us for things that happen to us. He walks alongside of us in the valleys of life. The good shepherd doesn't run when there's trouble. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. We serve a God who bore a cross, a God who subjected himself to the ultimate vulnerability for us. We serve a God who's been through trauma, the wounds, the scars that prove his love are still there today. Last fall, Anna and I had the opportunity to go on a road trip that took us to Atlanta, Georgia, One of the things that we did while we were in Atlanta was visit the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. It's a powerful, powerful experience. Perhaps the most impactful exhibit we saw that day was the memorial of the four young girls murdered in the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. Dr. King led the memorial service And his words from that service still convict us today as they relate to any kind of abuse allowed to exist in the church. Speaking of the four little girls killed in the bombing, he said, and they died nobly. They are the martyred heroines of a holy crusade for freedom and human dignity. And so this afternoon, in a real sense, they have something to say to each of us in their death. 
They have something to say to every minister of the gospel who has remained silent behind the safe security of stained glass windows. And we would say not only ministers, but woe to any Christian who would hide anything behind the safe security of stained glass windows. God's church is not to be a hiding place for darkness. It's to be a a safe haven, a place of safety for the hurting, for the oppressed. At the site of the tragedy in Birmingham, as the church was still smoldering from the bombs detonated by white supremacists, the preacher stood up with a bullhorn and he started reciting Psalm 23. And it's told that in the midst of his reading, he noticed among the crowd one of the Klansmen involved in the bombing. He continued reading. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The good shepherd carries a rod and a staff to fight off predators. He stands faithfully beside the hurting and the abused, even laying down his own life. Though the face of Jesus had been lost in their stained glass window, the people of 16th Street Baptist Church knew that the real Jesus is not stained glass. The real Jesus is broken and poured out for us and yet alive and reigning today. He hears the cries of those who have been harmed. The real Jesus may be beaten and wounded and scarred, but his face is never missing. We can find it if we look. For he's always there. He's the good shepherd. As we close this morning, we're not going to have a time of response. I'm going to invite one of the members of our Caring Well team, Sierra, up to um, speak a prayer of lament over us. And this prayer will serve as our benediction this morning. Thank you. Join me in praying this prayer of lament. Please bow your heads. God, we are filled with sorrow and shame over the toleration and cover-up of of abuse in churches that bear the name of your Holy Son, Jesus Christ. We acknowledge that Jesus not only welcomed children into his presence, but he also warned others of the judgment that would come upon those who cause a child to stumble. When we think of the person and work of Jesus and how pastors and churches that were commissioned to continue his work have actually undermined it through sin, of omission and commission, we weep, we groan, our hearts break. Give us the courage and wisdom to make the changes that genuine repentance requires. And we ask you to have mercy on us according to the riches of your grace in Jesus Christ. God, forgive us for our negligence, lovelessness, fear, greed, pride, ignorance, selfishness, and any other motive that caused us to be silent and passive when we should have been vocal and active. The abuse in our churches should have been exposed, not hidden. God, in your great righteousness, let those who have, uh, those who have abused others or enabled abuse be brought to justice. Grant them to repent of their evil. Find forgiveness in Christ and accept the consequences of their crime in society. God, you are the stronghold of the poor and needy in their distress, a shield about your people. 
their glory and the lifter of their head. You execute justice for the abandoned and the oppressed. And you are the God of all comfort. So comfort our brothers and sisters who have been abused. In your kindness, restore the years that others have stolen from them. Help them to heal, to know your love and acceptance, and to hope in the full and final redemption of the one who says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing you recompense with me, to repay everyone for what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Go in peace.